So uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and, and talk about this. This is something that has changed, I think, my practice. And anybody I've talked to about this has, has anecdotally reported to me a, a reasonable benefit. So here are my disclosures. My real disclosure is that I think the endoscope is an elegant weapon for a more civilized age. So I am totally biased. So take that oh, for what you will. For those of you who are online watching this and you're endocurious and you, you do like open surgeries, this is the best lecture for you for the entire weekend because you'll get more benefit from this than anybody in this room because what you do hurts more. <laughs> Our surgeries don't hurt as much so you don't get as much of a benefit, but, it, but there is a, a significant benefit. Um, so this is, these are things that facilitate outpatient surgery, good minimally invasive technique, uh, taking less than three hours. That includes troubleshooting, so that doesn't mean you plan a three-hour case and then you run into trouble and it turns into six hours. That means with the trouble, you need to be under that time. Uh, you can't be transfusing people and it needs to be consistent and reproducible. So quality anesthesia, you don't want to over narcotize patients if done awake. And again, uh, Dr. Abdelbar and Dr. Houle both both gave uh, two different ways to do it, and I don't think it's either or, it's and both. So, you know, a transramal approach can be done awake. A fusion probably needs a spinal because you need a little more time. You need a little more uh, wiggle room in case there's uh, issues. So uh, if you do this awake, uh, you're gonna get consistent reproducible blocks with good uh, duration control and efficient placement. Uh, spinal anesthetic for the larger, longer cases, one-shot epidurals for like a decompression or for interlaminar cases, and then just sedation for transfer aminals is, is the way I do it. Um, so T-lip or ESP block, which is what I'm talking about today, is basically what I use is lysosomal, uh, well, I, I don't use lysosomal pupivacaine because I don't have it at my institution, not allowed to have it. Uh, but I would use it if I had it and uh, would mix it with bupivacaine. So one vial of lysosomal bupivacaine is 20 cc's, one vial of quarter percent uh, bupivacaine is 30 cc's, you mix it together, you get 50, and then you divide it up between the two sides. You need to use an 18 gauge needle if you're gonna do that, because if you use smaller than an 18 gauge needle, you'll strip the lysosome off the bupivacaine and you'll give a bolus dose of bupivacaine that is potentially cardiotoxic, so don't do that. Um, the mixture I use is ropivacaine, and I'll leave this up long enough, everybody can put their cameras up and take pictures. Uh, ropivacaine, 0.2%. I like ropivacaine because it's slightly less cardiotoxic than bupivacaine. I, for a bilateral block, I use 60 cc's. That's two vials. Each vial is 30 cc's. One cc, which is one vial of dexamethasone, which is 10 milligrams, and then clonidine is 100 mics or one cc. So these are all vials, so it's two vials of ropivacaine, one vial of dexamethasone, one vial of clonidine, you pop them all open, you dump them into a thing, you mix it and draw it up in the syringe, and you don't have to wait for a pharmacy to compound it or contaminate it or get the order wrong. Um, so you can do a T-lip with ultrasound and the pre-op like uh, Dr. Hool has done, or you can do just the, the erector spania block by the surgeon with fluoro, which is what I do. So the T-lip block is a thoracal lumbar interfascial plane block. The ESP block is an erector spinae block. They're basically the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I like the hesitation. <laughs> um, so it's the inverse of an thoracal abdominal plane block. So if you guys are familiar with uh, any, if you guys know any general surgery colleagues or you're married to one like, like I am, <laughs> you know that they can do um, uh, hernias and, and uh, lap coles like without, and without general anesthesia and you can block the ports and, and be very comfortable. So basically the tap block gets the anterior rami for the uh, ventral part and all the TILA block does is targets the posterior primary rami for posterior surgery. So uh, when was this first published? Uh, first of this was published in 2015 in the French Canadian literature, which uh, I don't read French, so I can't, I can't tell you that I read this paper from cover to cover, but uh, the summary is that you can place a needle in the plane uh, between the uh, longissimus and iliocostalis. Uh, so this is, this is a ultrasound, you can see the, uh, you can clearly see the spinous process. Is this, which is, oh here you go. Clearly see the spinous process, the facet, the transverse process, here's the multifidus, here's a stripe between the multifidus and longissimus. Um, here is a needle coming into that plane, some local anesthetic inflating the plane. And then here is the medicine in that plane. If you're like me, none of this, I can't tell what the hell's going on here. If there weren't labels on there, I wouldn't know what I was pointing at. It just looks like a Rorschach test to me. So. Um, this is anatomy I understand, right? So 
Spinous process, transverse process, facet. Here's your multifidus, longissimus, and, and iliocostalis. So the plane that they're trying to put this in is here. If you notice, that plane goes right along the transverse process. So this is the rector spinae complex. If you put the needle on the transverse process right there, um, you're basically doing the same thing. So if you do it with ultrasound, you're trying to hit this plane. If you do it with uh, fluoroscope, you're trying to hit that piece of bone. I can tell you hitting this piece of bone is way easier than hitting that plane with the tip, tip of the needle. And there's, and there's some evidence actually that uh, using the ultrasound guided may be a little less uh, consistent because sometimes you're gonna inject it intramuscular and not gonna get it all to go into the same plane. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would tell, I'd be able to tell you if I could read French. Um, so um, this is what the needles look like when they go in. Um, this was a little bit of dye mixed with uh, some uh, an ESP block just to kind of show how it dissipates over time and you see it just basically travels down along that interfascial plane all the way down to the next transverse process and down a couple levels. This is from that uh, study from Canada where they actually had medical students that uh, volunteered to, for the participate in the study and they did ESP blocks on them and said, hey, can you feel that? Can you feel that? And this is the maps that they got. So sort of the immediate, uh, immediately afterwards and then this is like an hour later. So you can see that basically the block uh, dissipates and, and travels downward as gravity pulls the medicine down. So I do these blocks at the beginning of the case before I make my incisions so that they're kicking in when I'm done and they're waking up and they feel comfortable. So. Um, again, what's in a TLIP block? If you missed the first one, get your phone out, get this picture. Uh, so 20 cc's of lysosomal bupivacaine plus 30 cc's of 0.2% preservative-free bupivacaine in an 18 gauge needle or a larger diameter. Um, basically, you can go uh, a, a level or two above wherever you're operating. There's really no reason to go below L3 because at L3, you're gonna get everything below it anyhow. And if you do go below L3, or if you have a very, very small transverse process at L4, it can leak and, get, and block the lumbar plexus, which is, I've had that happen once and the patient woke up with a foot drop and she's like, I can't move my leg. I'm like, trust me, it'll be fine. <laughs> Just give it a, give it a little time. Um, but it, it's still anxiety provoking for everybody, not something you want. Uh, and again, I don't have lysosomal bupivacaine, so I use the Ropey, the Dex, and the Clonidine. I didn't like do any sort of incredible research and come up with this based on the chemical structure. Like this is what they do for brachial plexus blocks. I just stole that. So um, what about cervical spine? So I know this is a lumbar talk, but uh, add a little tip. You can do this in the cervical spine too. There's a semispinalis block. Um, semispinal services block, and then basically an ESP block. So an ESP block in the cervical spine is putting the needle down to the, to the uh, lateral mass, essentially. So there's a, say, another plane where the uh, posterior primary rami traverses in the cervical spine. So intersemispinal inter plane block is an analog to the TILA block, and the ESP block is an analog to the ESP block in the lumbar spine. So the way I do this, I place the needle on the lateral mass, um, a level or two above the area I'm, I'm looking for. So yesterday, Dr. Derman talked about using the AP image to get your level. I use the AP image to get my level in cervical and thoracic imaging, a cervical and thoracic approach. But when I do my ESP block in the cervical spine, I just leave the needle in up higher so that when I shoot a lateral to confirm where I am, I've got a marker that, that tells me that I'm about at the right level. So I have both AP and sort of lateral confirmation that I'm in the right neighborhood, but I really do rely on the AP imaging. So in the cervical spine, I only use 10 to 15 cc's. I use the same mixture. So I have make sure that the staff mixes the same stuff every time. I'm not telling them to mix one thing for cervical and one thing for lumbar and one thing for this and one thing because they will mix those up 100% of the time. If they have the same mixture every time, they'll only mix it up once in a while. Hmm. So um, it's the same mix. We just use less of it because I don't want it to leak into the canal and block somebody's diaphragm. So um, as in summary, all one and two level endoscopic cases can be performed safely and comfortably on an outpatient basis and the TLIP and ESP blocks help facilitate this. And uh, if you do anything more than a, 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 an endoscopic case, you actually get more benefit from this because it hurts more so you get a, a more effective block because you're blocking more pain. Thank you.
Really great talk. I had just one question. So you, you always do this right before you start surgery or at the end? And first what, thing I do. First so thing you do. We do the timeout. I always draw, you guys see how I draw the lines in the disc and lateral and AP and get the plane of this. Every case I do that. So I always know, I can look at the body and know where the plane of the disc is. Next thing I do is I drop the needles down to the transverse process or into the lateral mass. So I want to do that before I start the case because it has, it takes a couple hours for it to kick in and to dissipate. So I want it when they wake up for that all to be anesthetized and to have that nice block. Hey Ray, this Thank is you so much. I've been doing this for 20 years calling transverse process block. Do you get paid different from Medicare if you call it the other name? So, um, <laughs> so there is a code for uh, uh, an interfascial plane block. It's 64493, and sometimes you can get paid for it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that would have been rich. I, <laughs> I, uh, you can sometimes get it preauthorized. Sometimes they will reject your surgery because you have that code in, and I just tell them, okay, then remove that code. I don't, I'm not going to fight that battle if I don't have to. But you know, if you can get paid a couple couple cents here and there, it's certainly worth it. it, it it's less of an issue if your anesthesiologist do it because it's a separate um, it's a separate procedure for anesthesia and and to supplement the general anesthesia or or local anesthesia. Okay. One point. Uh, something better than zero.